Hi everyone, um, welcome to the 92nd um, session of the Med AI Group Exchange Sessions. And this week we have Hyungjun Chung from CASE here with us to speak about all their work on uh, generative diffusion models. Um, Hyungjun is a PhD student at CASE and he's a student researcher at Google AI. Um, his research interests lie in on the intersection between deep generative models as well as computational imaging. Um, he has pioneered many works on using diffusion models for solving inverse problems, and uh, many of them are focused on biomedical imaging. And he's completed his master's also at CAST and his bachelor's in, in Korea University. So thanks so much, Hyungjin, for joining us today. And I guess before we get started, do you have any preferences on how you'd like to take questions? Um, do you have some time allotted for that, or is it okay if we interrupt you in the middle? Oh, just feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, I, I tend to talk a bit fast, so please feel free to um, interrupt with your mic on so that I can um, slow down. Okay. And yeah, thanks, yeah. Anita, for, for the kind introduction. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess without further ado, let me hand over the mic to you. Yeah, sure. Um, so hi, guys. Um, I'm Hyunjin Chung. And I'm today I'm going to talk about um, with a talk titled Generative Diffusion Models for Medical Imaging and specifically mostly focusing on solving inverse problems that arise in medical imaging. So generative AI and foundation models are the terms that we hear a lot these days. And by far the most hyped, I think, is the language model domain. But of course, we are also observing some powerful image generative models, such as stable diffusion, imaging, and so on. And these are generative models as they can generate new data from the learned distribution um, and they are foundation models because they're trained with gigantic amount of data. And nowadays, you really can't separate them because you need to train your model with gigantic amount of data to train an impressive generative model. And you need your model to be generative to fully exploit the capabilities here. You know, and of course, text and images are not the only one that are considered nowadays. There are three generative models. Uh, there are video generative models. It's really amazing and even painful to see the rate of progress. When you wake up in your bed and open up Twitter, you see yet another breakthrough. Uh, when you recall that there was a recent breakthrough just about a few days ago. But all the hype aside, as a biomedical imaging researcher and also an ML researcher, um, to us, generative models are nothing but a good way to model the data distribution, P theta of X. And we want it such that it closely emulates the true data distribution, P theta of X. But what do we really mean by data? And in practice, this is given by the empirical data distribution, and hence it is really capped by our ability to collect good large-scale data. And if you don't have high-quality data to train your model on some distribution, you're doomed on that specific subset. Another pr problem was that we needed to train a good model with a good parameter theta to approximate the empirical data distribution. Thankfully, due to, due to the com computational resource available now, we can scale up our model in a quite robust way. So coming back to our picture, currently foundational generative models do actually capture the empirical data distribution quite well. And among them, in this talk, we're going to focus exclusively on diffusion models out of all the generative models out there. But why should we even care about these? Well, first of all, these models are extremely robust and scalable due to the design of the loss function. And these are really nothing but denoising autoencoders trained with multiple levels of noise. And we all know that denoisers are very easy to train, and so it is robust. This is in sharp contrast to GANs, where the model is like a stack of cards, so it breaks down ever so easily. And remarkably, these can be easily understood also as flows and RNNs, but which is enabled with a layer-wise training. And this is because the forward noising distribution and the reverse uh, denoising inference distribution is predefined, and we can simply train one layer at a time. And probably because of this highly desirable property of robustness and the scaling ability, it seems that um, all modalities except for language, which is dominated by autoregressive models, are indeed converging um, towards the use of diffusion models. Um, from image to video and 3D assets, the fusion models are renewing the state of the art every week. And last but not least, the fusion models are highly modular. Um, this naturally comes uh, from their iterative refining nature, uh, where the image is gradually formed in a course defined nature, in a course defined manner, sorry. So in between the generative steps, we can constrain the generative path 
to follow a desired property that we want, which actually highly leads to the topic that we're going to mainly focus today, and that is Bayesian inference. Um, as we will briefly cover later on, diffusion models can be interpreted as score functions. And now in science and engineering, often what we want is to sample from the posterior p of x given y. And these diffusion models give us a natural way to perform Bayesian inference um, using diffusion models uh, by using a plug and play estimator of, of this um, score function right here. So since we have already talked about why diffusion models are good, let us briefly just um, recap what these models are. Well, diffusion models are denoisers, such that in the generative process, it creates data by iterative denoising. Um, in order to train the diffusion model, we use the same network D and parameters theta, and also take the time T as an additional input to train a denoiser on multiple noise levels. And usually this denoiser is quite large since it learns from the gigantic amount of data, and also since it has to learn the noise from multiple noise levels. Uh, but really, in essence, these are just denoisers. Another remarkable thing about these diffusion models that I briefly mentioned in the previous slide is that they can be interpreted as score functions, or in other words, they're a gradient of the log prior distribution. And so interpreting the diffusion model in the continuous framework, we can interpret the generative process as running a specific stochastic differential equation governed by this score function, which lets us sample from the data distribution. And so visually, um, this is what happens when we generate uh, diffusion, uh, some sample from diffusion models. OK, so I think that was enough ranting about what diffusion models are and why they're good. But we still have been talked about how these models are relevant to inverse problems, and especially inverse problems that arise in biomedical imaging. So let us now, now dive into the meat of the topic. So in the world of biomedical imaging, we're often interested in the inverse problem where there's signal x um, that we would like to retrieve, but all we have is the corrupted measurement y obtained through some imaging system. And because these problems are ill-posed, in order to achieve a good solution, we need a good prior for this. Some of the canonical problems arise in medical imagery construction problems, um, including MRI, uh, CT, PET, uh, you name it. Now let us come back to the problem formulation. Now in the Bayesian perspective, as I said earlier, there are so many feasible x's that could produce the same y. So it would only make sense to specify the distribution of good x's rather than a single point estimate. And here what you want is to perform posterior sampling. You want to sample from the distribution p of x given y, where y is given uh, by this equation, ax plus eta, where eta is some noise. This is really different from the usual supervised learning setting, where you have pairs of data x's and y's, and so you try to learn the direct inversion from y to x, which is usually done through this kind of neural network g of theta. And hopefully during this amortization process, the neural network generalizes as well so that even when it gets some data that are slightly different from what is seen from the training data set, it generalizes sufficiently well. Well, for posterior sampling with Bayesian inference, the paradigm is completely different. First, we train a generative diffusion model p theta of x that tries to emulate the empirical data distribution. Now note that at this stage, we don't have to know anything about the measurement process. In the second stage, once p theta of x is well trained, here comes in our data fidelity y equals ax. And since we have access to p theta of x, all we have to do is find the points lying in y equals ax. That also lies in the support of p theta of x. This is sampling from the posterior p theta of x given y. One immediate advantage of this kind of approach is that we use we can use this pre-trained prior in a plug-and-play fashion, regardless of the forward model. We always have to find this intersection between p theta of x and the given measurement model at hand. And this would be another case of a different forward model. And we can see that how we could be able to use this as a plug-and-play prior. To see how posterior sampling can be done with diffusion models, let us um, um, just briefly revisit the usual sampling procedure with diffusion models. Since this is just sampling from p theta of x, we can simply run the reverse SD numerically by discretization. Notice the existence of the score function, um, which will eventually let us sample from p of x. Well, what can we do when we want to sample from the posterior distribution? Well, one of the most straightforward way is to perform iterative projections, where you perform an unconditional update and do projections to the measurement subspace. 
Well, for cases in medical imaging, when we have linear measurements, it turns out that such data consistency projections are simple to perform and can be done in a closed form without noticeable co computational cost, especially when you have sparse measurements. For the case of MRI, the projection steps simply correspond to taking your known case-based measurements and replacing them to the current iteration. If you do these steps uh, again and again in between the denoising steps, you will be able to sample from the posterior um, that enjoys the data consistency uh, with respect to your measurements. And really for the case of CT, it is mostly the same. When we apply this procedure iteratively after each denoising step, at the end, we want um, our desired sample that is consistent with the measurement. Now, one notable advantage of these methods is that, I mentioned this earlier, but they're not agnostic to the Ford model. And this is especially relevant for the case of MRI measurements, as there are so many different subsampling schemes um, that are existent um, according to the circumstances. And as we do not require any knowledge about the Ford model during training, um, it is agnostic to the Ford model and adapts to different measurements perfectly well. And notably, it achieves state-of-the-art performance and is particularly strong at capturing high-frequency detail, probably due to the iterative refinement nature. Another intriguing property of these models is that since we're essentially sampling, sampling from the posterior distribution, every time the reconstruction will be at least slightly different. And due to this property, we can compute the uncertainty. And note that the uncertainty measured with pixel-wise standard deviation grows as acceleration factor grows. Now, moving further into tasks other than reconstruction, also for medical image denoising, we can also leverage this reverse SDE by hijacking the process, assuming that we know the level of the noise level of the given image. Notably, in practice, this can be usually approximated with an off-the-shelf off variance estimator. And even for the cases where the noise distribution deviates from Gaussian and the estimator cannot give a good estimate, thanks to the generalization capacity of these diffusion models, uh, the resulting uh, denoised uh, reconstructions are quite good. And again, due to, this, due to such generalizability, we can easily control the extent of denoising by controlling where to start the denoising. Also note that we can also quantify uncertainty for the case of denoising, similar to what we did for the case of reconstructive tasks. Okay, so I think we did enough showing how option one of alternating projections work. Let's now dive into the second more recent method of, perform of performing posterior sampling with diffusion. Here the idea uh, is simple. Can I ask a quick question here before you dive right. into the Sure, sure. So if you go back to the closed form solution, like, um, equation for your MRI, is that under the assumption that um, you can always have like a, a linear mapping from your sample space to the image, or is that something that could change based on it? Um... Right, you're completely right. The, in, in order to perform projections, uh, the measurement has to be linear here. So, and also um, the, the disadvantage of projection-based method is that you can't um, have measurements that are noisy. If you project into the subspace where the measurements are noisy, you're going to, you're also going to get a noisy reconstruction. So um, the two points that I mentioned will be covered in the later topic, with how we can um, extend that to nonlinear things and with some measurement noise. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, okay. All right. So yeah. So relate to what Nandita asked. Um, here we're going to focus on the task of posterior sampling, but we're going to take an option two where we work out the math directly with Bayes' theorem. So this is useful because for most inverse problems, the likelihood P of Y given X is typically known. For example, if for Gaussian or Poisson measurements, um, we can just simply plug in um, some, some analytical formulations. However, care must be taken because this gradient of the log likelihood in this case is in fact intractable. Um, this is different from my claim earlier that the likelihood function is in most cases known, but this arises from the fact that there are noisy XIs here arising from the uh, diffusion process. So let us dive into closely examine what I mean by this. To see why this is the case, consider the following probabilistic graph in the context of diffusion models. We know two conditional distribution, p of y given x0, this is the measurement process, and p of xt given x0, which is the diffusion process. And for the sake of simplicity, um, 
I'm going in, I'm going with an example of in painting here. So the first distribution is the measurement distribution, which is typically Gaussian, and the second one is the forward distribution, uh, forward diffusion distribution, which is also Gaussian. However, the reverse distribution, p of x zero given x t, shown with blue dotted line here, is intractable in general. So uh, p of y given x t, uh, following this path, is intractable because we have not much information about this blue dotted line. So in our work, we aim to approximate the intractable distribution uh, by factorization. Since x0 is conditionally independent on y and xt, we can factor the integrand as follows, where the former term is what we know and the latter term is what we partially know. By partially known, I mean that we know how to obtain the posterior mean of the distribution, which is given, given by the Tweedy's formula. And while this may sound fancy, this is nothing but computing the denoised estimate with the prediction uh, predicted residual noise of the score function. And it just happens to be that the equation matches with the classic Tweedy's formula of computing the posterior mean. And as you can see in the figure, as the pre-trained diffusion models is very powerful, it is capable of predicting the denoised estimate even when we have uh, such very high noise. But there, there would be some uncertainty, right? Like how you are taking care of the uncertainty here. Oh, so um, here we're just approximating like a point okay. estimate. Uh, okay. So this is the, a posterior mean. Uh, but of course, uh, if we uh, start from a different random seed, we will have some uncertainty in the okay. re final reconstruction, right? So uh, one more quick question. So sure. Um, you said that the like. The y given x is also modeled as a Gaussian, or did I miss that? Or? That is modeled as Gaussian. I mean, I wouldn't say that it is modeled with the Gaussian. It, it is usually is is a Gaussian for for many imaging uh, applications. Is that necessarily and, true, or is that like a strong assumption to kind of? Place? I wouldn't say it's a too strong of an assumption because mm -hmm. um, in most imaging cases, including um, MRI, uh, you have your measurements that are typically not too noisy. Mm -hmm. And the noise will not be exactly Gaussian, but it can be sufficiently well approximated with the Gaussian noise. So I see, uh, I see. it's it's pretty much Gaussian in many cases. I wouldn't say all the cases, but yes. Thank you. And so to really fully enjoy the effectiveness of Tweedy's formula, and because leaving the expectation outside would be intractable, let us just for now push the expectation inside. And when we do that, by the Tweedy's formula proposition, we have a fully tractable distribution where the condition is now given by x0 hat, the denoised estimate um, from xt. So basically, um, this kind of approximation enables us to approximate p of y given xt with p of y given x0 hat, where this is some denoised estimate of xt. Now, while I will not go into the details, we can also derive a rigorous upper bound for the approximation gap that we propose here, uh, making the method theoretically possible. Now, thanks to the theorem, we can achieve what we call diffusion posterior sampling, or DPS in short. Uh, we can apply theorem one to get the approximation here. Then we can approximate the former term with the pre-trained score function, which is a denoiser, um, the diffusion model. And for the latter likelihood term, for example, Gaussian or Poisson, uh, we can just plug in the, the closed form formulas for these distribution so that uh, this becomes actually the minimizing the, res the residual between the actual measurements and the simulated measurements. Visually, what, we, what I mean by this is that um, in the forward pass, uh, we first achieve Tweedy denoised estimate through the score function. We compute the residual between the simulated measurement and the actual measurement that we had beforehand. Uh, we try to minimize this residual error uh, by using back propagation, and this would correspond to this correction term that we're going to use uh, for all the inverse problems. Now, note that the derived method always works when we can compute back propagation, and this is really the only condition. And hence, we can solve nonlinear inverse problems that are much beyond simple linear inverse problems. And here we list two additional cases that are applicable in our case. Now, incorporating ancestral sampling for DDPMs, we have our algorithm of DPS, where we can derive separate algorithms according to the measurements model at hand. So we're not really restricted to Gaussian, by the way. Um, 
note that line seven uh, is where DPS takes place. So if we were to remove line seven, we would be simply sampling from the prior distribution. Um, hence, our algorithm is very simple to um, implement. Now let's look at the results. Um, since our method is not dependent on the measurement model, we can apply the same score function to various problems. For example, super resolution, uh, in painting, Gaussian deep blurring, motion deep blurring, uh, base retrieval, which is by the way, not linear, um, and also some, some extreme cases where the measurement model itself is a neural network. Um, so all the method, uh, all the, re um, uh, the applications that I showed here are uh, restricted to mostly to image restoration problems, but it will be quite easy to extend it to the case of medical imaging and breast problem because the formulation is not at all different. Um, I think I can skip that. So before I dive into more, more detailed topics, um, do you have any questions up until DPS? Okay, I think I can move on. So note that up until now, we stayed in our comfort zone of two-dimensional non-blind inverse problems. And while many of inverse problems do live in these boundaries, we know that um, in practice, this is really not the case. What if we have a 3D mod modality, and what if we don't fully know what the forward operator is? And let us now discuss how we can extend the ideas to tackle these challenging cases. First off, let us consider the case where we have a parameterized forward model A of phi, but we do not know the parameters of phi. A canonical example would be the case of blind deep learning and the case of compressed sensing MRI, where we do not have the sensitivity maps for parallel coils. Well, in the paper called Blind DPS, we additionally show that diffusion models are not only effective for image priors, um, and for the examples for the case of blind deep learning, we can train another diffusion model that learns the distribution of the kernels, or more generally speaking, we can train a diffusion model to learn the distribution of the parameters of the operator. And so um, then running uh, the two different diffusion processes in parallel, uh, using the same idea from DPS, but now applied in parallel to two paths. Um, at the end, we can simultaneously estimate the parameter of the operator and the clean image. So now let us visually compare how this is different from standard DPS. Um, as we see here for standard DPS, we can think of it as a single stream version where we only have to est estimate the image since we already know this kind of operator. Whereas for blind DPS, um, we have two parallel paths since we do not have access to the ground truth um, imaging operator. And note that blind DPS is also theoretically grounded on Bayesian inference and can be thought of as an extension of, of DPS, even though I won't go into the details. From the results, we see that blind DPS is capable of producing the parameters of the operator and the image simultaneously with this also extending to the case where we have more than one type of parameters for the operator. And this is the case of imaging through turbulence where we both have to estimate the vector fields that move the pixels around and the blur kernel that uh, blurs out the image. Okay, let's move on to 3D. Um, as we have so many natural applications that are in 3D for medical imaging cases. And in fact, it's actually so, hard Sorry, to... can I ask one, one quick thing? So for the the image that you were showing before, you have mm -hmm. two different operators, right? You have the turbulence operator as well as the deep blurring, blurring operator, right? Right. You're estimating right. both operators simultaneously here? Um, no, I actually trained um, two operators with a different neural network. So ah, there, okay. there's this three diffusion models, one for the image, one for the turbulence, and one, and for, one the, for the uh, blurring. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So coming back to 3D. Um, it's, it's actually really hard to come up with a fully two-dimensional inverse problem for the case of medical imaging. So it, all the problems that naturally arise are mostly 3D. But we have to note that in medical imaging, it is of absolute necessity to have a reconstruction with voxels as we want a precise interior. Um, the problem being that the representation is notoriously memory heavy. And because of that, it is almost impossible to construct a 3D voxel diffusion because two-dimensional diffusion models are already extremely computationally heavy. So our proposal is to leave two-dimensional diffusion model as is and try to incorporate lessons from the more classic literature. 
Specifically, we bring the total variation prior, which essentially states that natural images tend to have sparse gradients. In particular, we choose to impose TV only to the redundant C direction, as for XY dimension, we assume that the diffusion, the diffusion prior is pre-trained and pretty much covers it all. We can implement our ID as follows. First, we denoise each slice with two-dimensional score functions in parallel. And if we only use step one iteratively, we get slices that are independent of each other, just conditioned on the measurement, um, such that when we've seen from the coronal or the sagittal slices, they are incoherent. Hence, in the second step, we aggregate the slices to form the volume and minimize the following subproblem, which imposes both the data consistency as well as the TV prior to the Z direction. And the optimization can be performed effectively with, for example, ADMM. We can visualize our method as follows. Again, in the first step, denoising is performed independently across the slices. Then, to improve the consistency across the slices, ADMTV suboptimization scheme is imposed jointly. Now, we do have some other tricks proposed in the paper to accelerate the optimization process to accelerate this kind of uh, suboptimization approach, but let's disregard, uh, disregard that for now as technicality. And with the proposed method, we're able to achieve reconstructions from an extremely limited number of views. Uh, note that uh, the reconstruction was done with a diffusion model that, were, that was only trained on two-dimensional slices, um, two-dimensional axial slices, but it's able to give like a coherent reconstruction throughout the volume. And what's more, in the follow-up paper of TPDM, we additionally show that we can even further improve the 3D reconstructive performance by completely throwing away the TV prior and modeling the 3D prior now as the product of two perpendicular two-dimensional prior Due to the higher high expressivity of these diffusion priors, uh, we actually observe a dramatic performance gap against diffusion MPIR, which is the previous approach, um, together with, with much simplified inference algorithm, as now we don't have an additional ADM MTV optimization skip. And what's more, since the proposed method is a fully general three-dimensional prior, when we have no measurements and want to do unconditional sampling from the prior distribution, we show that we can also do that, and we achieve a state-of-the-art performance also in this aspect, without the model trained from uh, three-dimensional data directly. So before moving on to um, the last part of the talk, do you have any questions up to now? Um, I had a quick question, more on the, like the experimental side. So mm -hmm. um, for instance, when you did that blind, um, like basically when you did not know the ground truth, mm -hmm. you could see that there was like some like the ground truth and th there might be some hallucinations that are kind of going on. Right, right. Is that something mm -hmm. that, that, you know, in a medical image is, is kind of problematic in case there are, um, uh, like maybe it's not a normal X -ray, uh, CT scan that you're trying to reconstruct. Is that something that you observed in your experiments? And So I, I have, I think I have two comments there. First mm -hmm. of all, um, in, in the problem of uh, in the paper of blind DPS, we actually focused on inverse problems that are extremely uh, degraded. For example, mm. when you see the measurement um, here, you really can't recognize uh, mm. who it's going to be, right? So there can be so many multiple solutions to to solve this measurement problem, and yet it does kind of um, it does give me an impression, at least, that uh, this this reconstruction would be a feasible solution. If, for example, if we were to re-blur this with this kind of blur kernel, I think we would get something similar to this, right? That's really a natural problem that arises when we have extremely sparse measurements or extremely degraded measurements. So for the case of medical imaging inverse problems, I don't think we have um, this kind of extremely um, degraded measurements in most problems. So in those cases, I think there probably would be some kind of hallucin or hallucinatory effects there, which would probably be undesirable. So we would probably need some further investigation there. But for mildly um, degraded inverse problems, we do not observe some um, extreme, uh, like uh, some some artifacts that are um, generated randomly. So yeah, oh, that's, that's good my to hear. comment on that. Yeah. So actually, how many actual or sagittal slices used for the three D reconstruction? 
um, the, this, the, the size, yeah. yeah, the size of the volume was, I think uh, the numbers show up here. It's 256 yeah, yeah. by 256 by 450, something like that. Right. So how many actual slides you use to reconstruct this volume? Uh, by slices. As a measurement. Mean... As a measurement, yeah. Well, for the measurement, we, we have the measurement across the whole volume since this is a CT. Ah, okay. So, so yeah. you have all the slice for that reconstruction. Right, right. Okay. But the thing and is, do you if know, we do you know the thick, do you know the thickness, like slice thickness for this? Because uh, when you actually acquire the MR CT, you have multiple different types of slice thickness, right? This is the Mayo AAPM data. I'm okay. not. I don't specifically recall the slice thickness, but um, I don't know. I, I would have to look it up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I have no idea. Because it would be really nice to also measure, like, kind of like as Nandita was also pointing out before, like measure and kind of uncertainty also for mm. the volume reconstruction, just to see that if your volumes are different when you are re reconstructing every time. Because sometimes if the slice thickness is like very rough and the abnormality falls in between, so it's the same as your blood, right? But you, are, you don't know like what is going to reconstruct it then. That's actually a good point. We haven't tried that. Because um, in the in the data set, as far as I mm -hmm. recall, there were no like abnormalities that can right. be um, seen there. So I think it would be like a very promising research direction if we like uh, if we try reconstruction on uh, some kind of torso with some abnormal uh, abnormality. Right. Yeah, right, right. But we have some kind of uncertainty there. Yeah, good point. All right, so um, now that we have arrived at the final part of the talk, um, in this part, we will discuss the generalization and adaptation of diffusion models, which is actually one of the most interesting works uh, that I've done so far in the field of diffusion models uh, based inverse problem solving. And by the way, um, this is the first time I'm talking about this um, subject in, in public. Uh, the paper is not up on archive yet. Uh, it's going to be up there in about a few days. So I hope I hope you guys enjoy it. All right, so consider the following diagram, where we have out of distribution test data, which is clearly distinct from the training data and hence the support of our diffusion model. This kind of problems arise in all sorts of places in inverse, in inverse problems. For example, your test data can simply be an outlier and you didn't expect this to happen. A slightly more troublesome case would be that you simply did not have enough training data to train a new prior. This again happens uh, often as medical data are hard to collect. And when training data is sparse, your network will not be able to generalize well. And your test data could easily deviate from such sparse samples of empirical data. Last but not least, the collection of the gold standard data could be simply impossible. Consider the case of four-dimensional cardiac imaging. Even if you were willing to collect gold standard fully sampled data, it simply wouldn't be possible as the heart will move and there wouldn't be enough time to collect all the data in a limited time horizon. We can also think of the case of black hole imaging where it simply wouldn't be possible to collect a fully sampled case space, let alone construct a data set out of it. <clears throat> well, what happens if you try to solve an inverse problem with the pre-trained diffusion model uh, prior in, in such cases? Well, on the left, you see what you desire. You are sampling from the correct support of data while being consistent with the measurement. However, since all you have is the support drawn by orange, you will only be able to sample from uh, the pink region, not even being to able to fully meet the data consistency. As an illustrative example, we trained a diffusion model using these ellipses data, which are phantoms that can be generated on the fly. Applying a diffusion model trained on, on these data and adapting it to in vivo AAPMCT data, we see that diffusion sampling, while producing an OK reconstruction, is contaminated with artifacts that resemble patterns from the training data. Well, if this is diffusion model, like if this diffusion model is like the best way we could hope for, can we do better? Namely, can we adapt the diffusion models for the given measurement? Or specifically, given a single corrupted measurement at test time, we would like to adapt the parameters of diffusion models such that um, adaptation can be done on the fly during reconstruction and we do not lose the prior information learned through the diffusion model. 
seeing the plot on the right, we wish to push up the blue dots here on the right as close as possible to the plot y equals x, which would mean perfect generalization. And as a teaser, we're seeing um, our proposed method does push up it, uh, push it up quite a bit. Now, in order to achieve such adaptation, let us revisit deep image prior. In deep image prior, we have our network G of theta, um, which is initialized with random parameters. And if we were to minimize the following loss with the Gaussian noise Z as input, um, we would be able to get a decent reconstruction as CNNs favor images that, images that lie on the natural data manifold. Well, extending this framework for diffusion models, we propose to use a loss similar to DIP. Here, we have the score function in the place of a generator, XT, the noisy input in the place of a random Gaussian noise. Oh, and by the way, this is a typo, sorry. Uh, this should be XT, not, not X hat here. Namely, we would be able to minimize such loss in a multi-grid fashion with different time step Ts, adapting the parameters during the inference with multiple time steps. This can be also thought of as a dual approach to the usual uh, diffusion model-based inverse problem solvers, where we would optimize the following same loss, but make up uh, make updates to XT rather than the parameters of the neural network. Um, recall the gradient update steps that, that I used to use for DPS, or blind DPS, and so on. Now, in the previous slides, we simply denoted x hat zero given t as the reconstruction with the score function. Well, would Tweety denoising be enough here? The answer is not really, because at the earlier stages, without leveraging the information from y, the posterior mean could be way off and um, be not such a good approximation for the reconstruction. And in order to mitigate that, we leverage a pr proposition from a recent paper of Ravula et al where they state that the posterior mean that is additionally independent on the measurement y is nothing but the posterior mean plus some measurement consistency gradient descent step. Specifically, in order to compute this in a fast way, we additionally use a DDS approximation, which uh, is simply approximating the unit Jacobian of the diffusion model uh, to be the identity, similar to how it's done in dream fusion and so on. Uh, this is done because we want to avoid backprop and in order to uh, make the computation fast. During the adaptation, we decide not to fine-tune the whole model, but to fine-tune just the additional parameters that is injected via LoRa. And by the way, LoRa is short for low-rank adaptation that are often used in large language models and also diffusion models nowadays. And the reason for doing this is twofold. First of all, um, by adapting only the additional parameters, we can fully retrain the prior information learned from the training data, so it's kept here. Uh, moreover, the parameters that we additionally have to save is much cheaper than saving the whole model. And this is consistent with the current trends with customizing foundational models for personal usage. Summing up, we have the following algorithm. Notice that the diffusion model-based inverse problem-solving sampling steps are done in the usual way. The only thing that changes is the additional adapt, uh, adapt block in between where we update our network parameters using the measurement at hand. So this is the adaptation process that happens at every time step t, which is analogous to how we would train um, deep image priors. But um, since we have like multiple time steps, we're doing it in a multi-grid fashion. Now let's look at the results. Notice that the second row and the third uh, and, and the first row correspond to the cases where we use diffusion model-based inverse problem solvers without adapting. Um, clearly, we observe hallucinatory artifacts um, coming from the training sets, ellipses and AAPM. When we adapt to Walnut, since this is an out of distribution data set, we observe some hallucinatory artifacts, especially for AAPM. It's, it's actually kind of cool to see that uh, it, it hallucinates the beds that, uh, that uh, patients lie on. And now when using SCD, the proposed method, we observe a surprisingly huge increase in performance while um, eliminating the hallucinations almost perfectly. We test this across many different variations of the data sets and see consistent improvements through the case of sparse few CT here. And since this is a general solver that can be applied to any inverse problem, we see that a similar effect can be um, seen also for compressed NC MRI. Uh, with noticeable difference uh, in the hallucinatory artifacts that arise during sampling. 
Now the question is, why would this work in the first place? We didn't have a single queen image, let alone a data set of the newly targeting distribution. Well, to give an intuitive example, let us recall that the overall picture of two disjoint distributions. Here, the orange um, indicates the learn prior, and the purple represent the newly tar targeted distribution. Note that even if these two distributions may be disjoint, the important thing is that they still lie in the manifold where, where the natural image resides. And when making updates to network parameters, since we only have the measurement, um, and that is the only constraint that we can give to the model, the, par the parameters may be updated such that it does not cover the uh, purple distribution at all, as shown on the left, which is undesirable. On the other hand, the desirable update would be adaptation of the parameters to say on the manifold M while covering the purple distribution and also obeying the data consistency. The remarkable thing is that since the diffusion network is yet another convolutional neural network, it favors the natural manifold um, and the right picture is indeed right, uh, indeed what is chosen from the training. And this happens in a much more robust way than standard deep image prior as we're starting from an already powerful foundational diffusion model. Right, so I think that was uh, most, mostly it for today's long talk. And I guess I, I have three main points that I really want to stress. Um, first of all, foundational diffusion models are good inverse problem solvers. They're versatile, robust, and flexible. Second, once you have access to that foundation model, your prior is pretty much already there. What you would have to do is find the right way to leverage the prior. Well, what can you do if you uh, if your training distribution and your testing distribution is different? Where well, we learned from the last section that uh, there's a good way to adapt your diffusion model that can correct for this discrepancy. And with that, I think I can uh, wrap my talk, and I'd be happy to answer uh, questions if you have any. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Hyungjin. I think this is an amazing talk and you covered like so many different aspects of diffusion models, like from all the way from the beginning, as you kept adding uh, more and more uh, interesting scenarios. So I guess before we uh, move on to questions, let's give our speaker a round of virtual applause. Um, and yeah, let me open up the floor Thanks, for guys. questions. Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, this is really nice. I've got two questions, if you don't mind. One is a, a short question, which is, how fast is it in your experience to run the diffusion model after it's trained? Right, so that's that's a good question because I guess really the only disadvantage of using diffusion models is its inference speed, right? And since it's iterative, you have to run multiple NFEs uh, in order to get like a feasible good image. So most of the earlier works that were done, especially for inverse problem solvers, uh, we usually it re usually require like a thousand to two thousand neural function evaluations to get like a decent image that will correspond to a few minutes, even for a single two dimensional image. But now, since the samplers are getting more advanced, um, for now I think it typically requires just about a few seconds to get a decent two dimensional image uh, when sampling from from the diffusion model. So it's getting better. Okay, that's good to hear because we are in our in our group. We're doing super resolution on large data sets that are volumes, and when we do two D images, and it still takes a few seconds per two D image, and usually right, you have right. two hundred fifty six or five hundred twelve of them, and you also do it for two different orientations. Uh, good luck with it that. scales up really, really big. <laughs> right, um, right. But it sounds like in your in your experience, everything is still speeding up, and the community knows the diffusion community knows that this is a problem. Of that course. Okay, right. my second question might be a little bit uh, more, which is how, when you're solving an inverse problem like this, for example, like in painting or super resolution, and you're working in like a mission critical field like medical imaging, how can you really trust the results you get afterwards? So maybe my example is uh, you, you showed five millimeter slices that you improved with your Z directional super resolution. And you also showed maybe this heavily blurred uh, human face um, and I was thinking, you know, what we like to do a lot in medical imaging is we'll do science on like the sulcal folds, right? And I feel like this is analogous to doing science on the hair, the hair strands <laughs> that you see in natural images. And if you're going to try to do science on hair strands and it's like 16 times super resolution, it yeah. may look real, but how can you trust those results? 
Yes, again, that's, that's kind of my question. Yeah, that's a that's a good question that I that I get asked often when I show results, especially for the case of like extreme inverse problems. And those are the image that I usually show because it's fancy. But really, um, when we're talking science, um, as you said, we have some kind of um, ground that we can speak on that um, that this is really not hallucinatory and and this is real. But really, the only thing that we can say is that it's a feasible solution. And by feasible, I mean that if we were to oper like uh, reapply that imaging operator that generated the blurred data, it will give like a consistent uh, measurement that you started with, right? That's the notion of of a feasibility. So, like for for inverse problems, that's that's the best you can get. I mean, like the. But the thing is that for, for traditional supervised learning, deep learning methods, the, the best um, reconstruction that you would get is like a point estimate. But for diffusion models, we're getting better because even for extreme case of inverse problems, you would be able to sample from the posterior. So you would have like multiple feasible solutions um, uh, that look fancy, but also um, completely matches the feasibility um, criterion there. So. You know, when doing science, especially for medical imaging cases, I think it's really crucial that you don't only sample just one reconstruction, but but sample multiple reconstructions from the same measurement in order to build your um, kind of um, trust on on what you get um, from from those models. I think that's the best I can comment. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um. I had another question, I guess, while other people are thinking about. So I was very interested in, in the, the in the final part of your talk where you're basically adapting to multiple distributions. Right. right so right. In, in sort of the theory as well as the the kind of experiments that you showed, you have um, a domain that you use during training, and then you have this target domain that you're kind of adapting to. Mm -hmm. um, could you also think about like? multiple target domains like is that something like is it theoretically does it mean that you can start with one domain and then kind of keep adapting to different domains or how does oh. that look like so i think that will be a different application because for inverse problems if you have like a single measurement that would um correspond to some specific distribution right mm -hmm. it wouldn't come from multiple different distributions so our our method will work on that case but I'm not sure what specific application when you're thinking about when you say uh, multiple different distributions. But if we're saying that we have like consecutive measurements from different distributions and we're applying this algorithm to, uh, to let's say this slice and then to this slice, I think it will work uh, pretty much so the same way. Maybe the next slide when you had this brain to me kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So what were the two dis like distributions? Like was it basically like directly oh. going into the knee or was it just like you're using your model in, in uh, doing inference? Oh, so things? basically, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, my, my earbuds was disconnected. Um, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think we lost your slides as well, um, your screen share. Can you hear us? Right, right. Yeah, um, let me try to reshare that. Uh, yeah. yeah, right here, uh, what we were doing is uh, we we have a pre-trained diffusion model on brains, mm -hmm. and then we're adapting that uh, to the measurement on knee when we have this kind of measurement, right? Mm -hmm. so in that case, uh, we would just have to um, adapt our, our diffusion model on that single measurement specifically. So I guess my question then would be like, let's say you have your diffusion model trained on brain and then you adapt it to uh, a measurement on knee. But then now when you have an, uh, like let's say maybe your ankle or something. So if you have mm -hmm. a different measurement on an ankle, could you use the same like diffusion model um, identically or would you have to change the procedure because you're adapting from one? Uh... Oh, oh no, you could use um, the same, same algorithm directly. I mean, I haven't tried uh, doing like consecutive adaptations mm -hmm. like you mentioned, oh, but that that's a good point. I, I would have to add that experiment, but yeah, yeah. 
yeah, I was just curious, like, because if you had consecutive adaptations, is it basically like you're starting from the training model and then adapting it in parallel to two different distributions? Or is it basically like, do you get some more additional benefit by like having Oh, that? that's, that's, that's actually a very good question. Um, currently, with our algorithm, we're not observing too much um, improvement when we're doing sequential um, adaptation with multiple measurements. Even, mm -hmm. it, even if they're from the same distribution. Um, so we basically reinitialize uh, the model uh, like delta thetas every time. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a very interesting um, venue of future research because intuitively, if we were given like multiple measurements, for example, mm -hmm. from a single volume, then the model would have to be able to better adapt, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's a good point. Cool, thank you. Because I think for this sequential adaptation, you also have to make sure that uh, these are coming from the same manifold, right? Like if those distributions right. are not from the same manifold, right. then probably your the primary hypothesis will not be suffice. Definitely, yeah. Cool. Are there any other questions from the audience? I had a quick question, if you don't mind. Um, you're talking about the idea that you're producing a plausible image from the distribution of possible images. Um, you know, obviously in a, in a real world setting, um, you know, if you're gonna use this for medical imaging, um, someone has to interpret the study, so they need an image to use. Um, and I guess my question is, is there any way to use this? My presumption is that as you get blurrier, Etc. sort of push to more extreme levels, your distribution gets broader and broader of possible images that could fit. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way of thinking about you know, how do we decide what is a reasonable amount um, to push these things to? Um, is the, I mean, as a radiologist, will you give them an image and an uncertainty image or something mm -hmm. like that? I mean, how how do you foresee figuring where, where the guardrails are on this kind of technology? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. And it's really a, not an answered question up to now because we're so used to um, using like this single point estimate that we, for up to now, we didn't really consider um, what to do when we are given the capability of, of sampling from these kind of distributions. For example, we have like, um, we can generate like hundred different reconstruction from the from the single measurement, right? Like, I guess the the straightforward way to approach uh, to approach this is to take the mean of the reconstructions that I showed here. But then again, you're then you're throwing away the ability to sample from the distributions, like the ability to sample these these uh, plausible distributions because these plausible um, samples will be sharp and and contain these high frequency details. Now, like it, it, again, it's an open question, but I think the, the way you said it, um, to give the radiologist uh, three things, the set of plausible image that, can't, that were sampled from the distribution, the second, um, giving them the mean of the, of the image, and third, giving them the uncertainty of the image would be pretty much the best way that we can approach this for now. So this is really like um, related statistics where um, you're kind of summarizing the, your results with like uh, up to the second moment. We, we would probably have to come with some better ways to um, kind of summarize your, your um, reconstructions. But for now, that's, that's all I can think about for now. Does, does that answer your question? Well, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, it, it, it answers it in the sense, I, I was curious about hearing, you know, this idea of using the mean, obviously, that becomes much more computationally expensive. And as you say, you know, you're going to lose any sharp features in the image, which are often very important. Mm -hmm. So that's a concern, I guess. I mean, I, I think this is a real <laughs> important question to ask is, you know, what is an acceptable level of primary data? And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if there's some quantitative measurement that you can look at in terms of your uncertainty mm -hmm. um, at some level to say, well, 
you know, this would work okay for, you know, 4x undersampling, but not 8x undersampling. Like if we put like a some sort of bounds around how much uncertainty we were willing to tolerate, um, you know, even that is not yeah. great because of course the uncertainty is not uniform over the image, as you point out um, with this picture. So I guess, yeah. I mean, this is this is why this question comes up about you know hallucinations is that like you say we haven't had to worry about this because we in some sense we've gotten a point estimate but we also know a little bit about anatomy and artifacts such as that we can discard certain things that right. might be considered hallucinations the trouble <laughs> right. is we don't have that anymore and mm -hmm. the question really becomes you know is there is there any quantitative way to say I want an uncertainty index of X in my images. How how much undersampling can I use for that? Because people might be comfortable with that. Um, but again, generating really, images out of noise is naturally very um, just unsettling for a lot of radiologists, right? Yeah, I can I can definitely um, uh, understand. Uh, how it might feel for radiologists if we were to explain this algorithm that oh we're generating this this uh, images from noise and and how it might feel very uh, you know unnatural in a sense and I think you gave a very important question and I would be very happy if I could give like a decent answer to that question but unfortunately I don't have any um, I think this is a a quite new field. Um, it's it's still immature, in a sense, and people are working on trying to give uh, at least some kind of notion of like quantitative measure on how we can decide, like like a, like a close boundary on on to 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 measure our uncertainty about a reconstruction. Uh, and that field, as far as I know, is called conformal prediction, and that is applying. That is being applied to this field, but it's still very immature. I only know about like uh, one or two papers that uh, aim to do that. So, so I know that's a very important um, research field that we would have to focus on. But for now, unfortunately, I don't really have a good ans uh, answer for that. No, thank you very much for discussing it. I, I think that it's. I, I think that that's going to become important. Um, definitely, definitely. Thanks for uh, the nice question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, thanks everyone for the lively discussion. And I guess we are at, at the end of our time, but um, um, if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to Hyungjin or you can reach out to us and we'll put you in touch with him. And if you have like if you want to like look back to the talk, we'll post up um, the video on YouTube by um, tonight. So you can take a look as well. And we'll see you all next week. So thank you. Thanks, thank guys. You.